couple of legal matters before the meeting starts. We should be back in five to ten minutes.
Okay, thank you all very much. Apologize for the delay, but it's important things to discuss, some of which are on the agenda. Um, so welcome to the Collegiate Charter School Board of Trustees Public Works Session for Thursday, February 9th. This meeting has been um, advertised in compliance with Pennsylvania law and the bylaws of Collegian Charter School, including the date, time, and location. Um, it has been in Daily Local News, Collegian website, and on the Collegian calendar. Um, so with regard to agenda items, I believe we received some public comment. Uh, yes, we did. Uh, the first comment was submitted by Donna Rauchett from East Fallowfield, St. Kate's Way Area School District. Her comment is on the addressing transitions at CCS. I want to applaud administration and the board for considering the restructuring of the 500 and 535 buildings to reduce transitions. However, the proposed start date of the 2023-2024 school year will create an extra year of unnecessary transitions for the current fourth graders, parentheses, fifth graders in the 23-24 school year, and sixth graders who will be seventh graders in the 23-24 school year. It would be appreciated if further research could be done by both the board and administration to see if these extra one-year transitions could be removed so the children only need to make one change in a time where tra transitioning to buildings is difficult. As parents, we understand there are a lot of facility and other logistics that go into this, but the increased behaviors and challenges highlighted in the presentation as the reasons for reducing the number of transitions should be why this is started sooner rather than later. Lastly, with respect to the elementary schools acting as feeder schools, that creates a sense of two separate districts and means students will not get to know district-wide classmates until high school. It would be great to understand what the administration's plan is to ensure a sense of district-wide community. As parents, we do see and are constantly comparing in elementary schools what is done in the 150 building to what is done in the 468, 486. With separate buildings now potentially a 500 and 535, these comparisons will now continue until high school. This could also cause further challenges now with the transition to high school. The second uh, submit a comment is from Nancy Gober, uh, West Pipeline, Downingtown School District. And I will read as submitted. If we are only have four transitions for K-4, that's four buildings. What is happening to the other building? And if you are splitting K-4 up into two different buildings and then bring them together for five, that is not a good idea. They all can't be expected to come together if they have never been together. Downingtown Sixth Grade Center provide that. So they are the two submitted uh, comments on agenda items. There is an additional uh, submitted comment that just goes to a general comment, but it is about an agenda item. So we can deal with it now or wait. Go, okay. Uh, the last one submitted by Linda Bell, um, Chester uh, from Coatesville. Uh, and it's a general public comment. How will the bus go? Will they be with middle and high school kids? Will there be enough staff? And that's it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any comments from the public in attendance? Okay, not seeing any. Uh, we can move forward to reviewing the public meeting documents for next week. First up are the financial reports from Mr. McInerney. Um, you can hear me, right? Yes. Yes. All right. I got some good news to report for a change. Uh, right now, we are back in the black, uh, $677,000. But unfortunately, we're still about $190,000 behind plan. Uh, the biggest driver, Coatesville, presented their 22-23 uh, per student funding formula on January 24th. So we went and billed in February for March. And I was able to bill an additional $2.3 million in January for a year-to-date adjustment in funding from Coatesville. Um, the rate, the weighted average rate went up 8.5% from what I was using, which was last year's rate. 
Um, and that's a weighted average between the re regular education standards and the special education standards. Um, saying that, there are a couple of things we're still a little bit behind on. Uh, overall student funding is still $1.1 million behind. Our grant funding is uh, $1 million behind. That has a lot to do with timing. Um, utilities are about 700, I'm sorry, $75,000 behind, and that's just a general cost increase. Um, I've been seeing that all year and I have a feeling it's going to keep going for the rest of the year. Uh, our contracted services, student services, are behind about $670,000, most of it's this month. Uh, I accrued about $400,000 worth of expenses. Uh, the DCIU is a little late. In February, I got October, November, and December invoices. So I put, put those in and I doubled them for the accrual for the following quarter. So I'm covered for the next uh, month or so. Um, and also our grant expenses, once again, is a timing issue at about $153,000 unfavorable. To the positive, the uh, common area maintenance at uh, 477 is about $200,000 favorable. That's due to the purchase. Uh, furniture, first time I've seen this this late in the year, we're about $62,000 favorable. Uh, I want to commend Shannon and some other person, which I'm not going to name. Uh, we're finally utilizing a lot of the things we've been buying and instead of buying new stuff let's move this from here to there and saving ourselves a little bit of money um, interest we're about a hundred thousand dollars favorable in interest a lot of that is shifting the cash on hand to S&T Bank from PNC so holding it aside and uh, food service once again is doing a great job last month Mike did 55 over 55,000 meals in 17 days so it's, it's amazing the work that uh, they're doing over there. Um, the other thing I want to say right now, we have 55 days cash on hand. Um, we're going to be in that range the next couple months until we start getting the payments and paychecks. So we just billed them you know, quite a bit of money. And haven't seen them yet, and I don't expect to see them until March or April. Any questions? None for me. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Uh, in your packet were the board minutes from our January 19th public meeting. Were there any amendments, additions, or changes to those from the board? And we have now the, uh, the personnel list report. Hello. Um, this month, you'll see from the report that we've actually had a second month showing a decline in the number of resignations. Good news. Um, open positions, we also have, a, have had a drop in the current number of open positions. Um, it, that's true for support staff, although they are still the employee group with the highest number of open positions. Um, and they reflect about a little over 21% of the total overall number of open positions. We are continuing to hire faculty and staff. You'll see on the report this month we have seven new collegian employees. I, there's one correction. The one listed at the top, Alex Bove, he's actually a contracted uh, administrator on assignment from the CCIU. Any questions? No, thank you, Ms. Daly. Thank you. Okay, we have an overview of the high school program of study. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for your time. Um, in an effort to try and condense what is in the 74-page document, I'm sorry, um, just have a couple of notes to review in an overview with some of the revisions and additions. So I wanted to note that we updated the overall structure just for readability purposes, that the sections are different, and also I added in some statements of purpose just to indicate what we're trying to do with each of those sections. So for example, in the grading section, we started talking about something that we're moving towards K-12 in terms of mastery of learning, we wanna make sure that our emphasis is truly on what our kids are learning versus what our 
teachers are teaching. So we have moved, um, I'm actually jumping around a bit, we've moved the language to talk about artifacts and summatives. So currently in our handbook, we talk about formative assessments and how those should be graded. Truly a formative assessment is how a teacher is informed how their um, students are learning the material. We don't want those graded. We want, teacher, we want the students to be able to submit artifacts that shows how they're learning and how they're mastering material. So the language there changes in our yearbook and we're uh, yearbook, handbook, and we're calling everything artifacts and summatives. We have removed finals. We removed midterms this year, and that's because research really shows that those high stakes assessments are not what's best for students. We're doing summatives all the way along. Um, we're moving towards enrichment and also reteaching when students don't understand what's happening. Um, and it really, um, we're, we're giving students the opportunity to demonstrate what they've learned versus memorizing material. So it's just a difference in philosophy. Um, We've updated our late work policy. Currently, we are accepting things kind of post-COVID up until the end of the quarter. It doesn't make a ton of sense that students would be submitting artifacts long after the summative has been given. So we've updated the language so that students would need to submit their artifacts and then take the summative. We wouldn't be accepting work after the summative has already been given. Um, we've also added language for resubmission. This is also with our work for Mastery of Learning that um, students should be given every opportunity to demonstrate their learning. And so if they've failed a summative assessment, we'd like to give them an opportunity to request an opportunity to relearn and resubmit their summative, assess their summative assessment. So they would be given that opportunity and they would be given the higher of the two grades. Um, we would cap that at 80%, but they'd be, they'd be given an opportunity to show their mastery. Additionally, we updated language for transfer students so that students are given credit for the courses that they bring in, but their grades are not calculated into their GPA. We can't guarantee the other schools have the same rigor that we have, so we are just giving credit. We're not giving the calculation in the GPA for transfer students. Some things for additions. So we've talked about, um, you'll see in there what um, I'm calling college and career readiness days. There are certain days during the school year. Um, PSATs is a good example when we have 10th and 11th graders taking PSATs and we need to shut the building down because any bell, any transition during the day um, is cause for something that we need to report to the college board because it's um, something that's a discrepancy in testing. So we're encouraging families to take those days for college visits, for job shadowing days, if it makes sense for the students. Um, so there would be three days in the school year that we've identified. The PSAT day, which the date has not been released for next school year yet, and the first two dates of keystones where we test keystones. We would encourage families to target those dates for college and career ready days. And then on there as well, sorry my phone shut off. <laughs> On there as well as we have um, PDIS days. Um, our PDIS team has really been working hard to make sure that we're offering things that incentivize students. One of the things that they're always looking for is an opportunity to um, be released from instruction. So we're proposing that kind of like a first Friday celebration. This is after some research that I found in a couple of schools where um, they are asking for every fi Friday they get their students to leave early if they've earned a certain level of attendance, a certain level of grades, a certain level of um, behavior, no behavior write-ups. We are suggesting that we use seven targeted Fridays to be able to release our students at one o'clock. Um, and that also gives us a built-in time for MTSS. If we have students that are struggling with behavior, it gives us an opportunity to reteach. It gives us targeted time to tutor if students are struggling, and it also gives us additional collaborative time. But primarily, we think that this is something that will incentivize the kids through some of the surveys that we've done. So that is a suggestion there. Um, additional things that we've put in the handbook, graduation requirements, we provided a lot of clarity. The keystone pathways are something that are new to most of our families. So we included some really um, beefed up language to talk about what the keystone pathways are. We've also added information about NCAA eligibility. Um, with our courses, we've added in language just to clarify what is the difference between a core course, an elective course, what are core credits, um, because there was just still some confusion. We've talked about our MTSS process and how we intend to remediate keystones. And then there are four new courses that we are asking for permission um, in the proposal. 
Um, these are all from student request, um, things that they've talked about with their teachers. So comics, illustration, and animation would be a foundational art course. It's currently a unit in our foundational art course. They'd like to expand and be able to offer an entire course. AP Art and Design would be replacing our Studio 4 art course, and that way the students would be given the college credit, but also take that level of studio. Cultural Anthropology and Human Geography is an opportunity because currently we only offer AP Human Geography and other students wanted to take the elective. And then Digital Art and Image Manipulation is coming out of our Digital Photography um, class that was a unit there and students are really interested in this whole new concept of digital art. So any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Now we have the uh, middle school academic handbook. I believe Mr. Dryberg and <laughs> Flying Solo. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, before I start, if you don't mind, I do want to just recognize a few staff members who have joined us here tonight for support. Uh, so Courtney Lambert, Natalie Thomas, Marissa Donnelly, and Liz Stone. Thanks for being here. Um, so uh, our middle school academic handbook. Um, really not too many changes as compared to what we're using this year. Um, as I took a look at it, there's really just a couple uh, minor updates, a couple additions. So other than the, the, the little details, uh, in alignment with the high school, uh, Ms. Gallagher and I have talked a lot about being in unison with things, and one of them is uh, the removal of finals. So in the proposed handbook, I have removed that for next year. Again, research is showing that these high stake tests uh, really are not what is best for our students. Uh, so we're looking at ways that we can have some end of year bigger projects, but it would not be that big 10% of their final grade that it currently is. Uh, again, in alignment with the high school, uh, we're moving away from the term formative assessments and we propose to use the term artifacts. Again, that's in alignment with what a formative assessment really should be. And that it's not something that is graded, but something that our teachers are using within the classroom uh, to assess our students and their path to learning. I did add to our handbook uh, our current extracurricular activity policy. It was not in there. It was certainly important to be in there. Um, I've actually talked with uh, Ms. Capel, our director of athletics this week, uh, and we're working on something that is actually specific to middle school. So that is slightly different than that of which the high school uses. It's pretty much in alignment, but we want to use the middle school years as preparation and not necessarily holding them to those high standards that they're going to experience at the high school level, but still have standards for our students when they want to partake in extracurriculars. Uh, we do currently offer the resource level math and ELA classes. Uh, the descriptions just needed to be added into the program, so I did that. Um, and one thing that we're really excited about is in working with Dr. Bradley, who is the math supervisor for our curriculum department, uh, we've been talking all year about math and how we need to adapt our approach. We are seeing that in our high performing students, currently we offer Algebra 1 to our se incoming seventh graders. And that is working for some of them, but we are seeing a handful of them struggle to complete or successfully complete the Keystone exam at the end of the course which then adds in a whole new level of issue for us that we now have to solve for them. Uh, so with Dr. Bradley's help, we are proposing, and I've added to the handbook, a math 7-8 accelerated course as an option for our seventh grade students. We will still offer Algebra 1 to the seventh graders, but having this additional course will kind of give us that mid-ground to give these incoming seventh grade students an accelerated course that covers both seventh and eighth grade content and standards um, but they kind of combine them into themes. So the current uh, curriculum that we use, the Eureka Square, does have a course for that, which we will plan to utilize if this course is approved. And we really feel like this uh, provides those incoming seventh graders with that additional accelerated option, um, but is going to put them on a better track to be successful on their Keystone exam the first time they take it, which would then be in eighth grade. They would then progress to Algebra 2 and still be on that accelerated math course so they can achieve some of those higher level maths that they have at the high school. Uh, the only other thing, our, my team and I are still kind of talking through our late work policy, so that may be a bit of a 
change that I request um, later on in the year, but um, our current policy is similar to what the high school had, um, where we are accepting things up until the end of the quarter. I think we're gonna look to change that. So while it's not currently in there, uh, I may come back at some point and ask for that to be revised once my team has a little bit more time to discuss what is appropriate for our kids. Any and questions any, for any me? Any questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. You have to review all the material that you've covered mm -hmm. through the year, right? And if you don't have a final, you're not going to review a bunch of it. So that's just human nature, right? So how do you gauge that the kids have retained the information that you've covered throughout the year without an exam to find? Sure. So our, our plan is in most of those core area classes that the teachers would have some sort of culminating project. But it's not going to carry that same weight as the, the traditional final exam, that it's one test on one day. and. While there is a lot of review, both on the teacher side and the student side, we're finding that our students have been struggling with it and it has had a negative effect on them. So I totally agree that we need to see them at the end of the course showing their, their knowledge, their mastery of that learning in the content area. So we plan to do that through uh, more specifically uh, planned out projects and kind of bigger, more long-term things that teachers would do it towards the end of that course. Absolutely, I, I think that it would show us probably even better than a, a one-time test that the students still have retained that information. So in theory, it's the practical application at the end of the year as opposed to a rote test. Correct. More rooted in problem-based learning. Yep. Which will present them with a challenge. You know, it's, it maintains that rigor for our students but it just approaches it a different way. How do um, other school districts approach the same midterms and finals? Do they still ha maintain midterms and finals? Or uh, that's a good question. Uh, I know in my home district, uh, my own child is in Board Town Area School District does not have finals. They kind of do some of these end of year projects. Um, I believe that there are some middle schools that do, but I think that there's a majority of them that do not offer the traditional final exam at the middle school level. So is the thought that it's like a class specific or are you looking for more of a general cross subject type of project at the end of the year that incorporates? I envision it being more class specific. Um, certainly if there are opportunities to be you know, cross curricular with some things, that's always a benefit to us. Uh, we haven't quite had that detailed of a conversation yet, but in the conversations that we've had, it's, it's been a little bit more of the course specific. Any other questions? Can you just comment on something that Chris said in the first question that you did in terms of this secondary trend? Like my, I graduated from college within the last 15 years and I can count the number of classes on one hand that I had a final between. Um, everyone else, it was either a culminating project or most of them just ran a normal exam to close out the term. So I, I spoke to Chris. Yeah, that's, that has been part of our conversation as well as Ms. Gallahan and I have talked about this and, and making this proposal. You, you alluded to this, but are we measuring success of this change? I mean, other than students being happy not taking the final, <laughs> how are we going to measure that this was a successful change or not? Uh, so we're, we're actually having a, a rather large conversation about mastery of learning. And I know Ms. Gallagher again kind of alluded to it, but looking to change at how we are measuring that. Right, right now we have a, a course grade at the end of the year that has a percentage and it may be difficult for us to really gauge does that percentage equate to a, the level of understanding of the content area in that grade level. So uh, we are looking at making some different types of approaches with things. To measure it, I think we're gonna have to take a look at that at the end, right, and compare some of our successes. It's gonna be more of a long-term thing that at the end of the year, not only are we looking at final grades, but are our students more prepared for those upcoming classes? Are they better prepared for high school and then beyond?
I, I think it'd be interesting to see what, what kind of metrics you choose to go with. I'd love to have you come back and just uh, <coughs> share that with us. Absolutely. I'd be happy to do that. But yeah, it's, it's a long-term thing, right? You Absolutely. don't know how well you did in seventh grade until you get to eighth grade. And maybe sometimes even 10th and 11th. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Next on the agenda, we have uh, our initial draft of the 2023-2024 school calendar. Sure, um, just some broad stroke highlights. Uh, the beginning of the year, similar to this year, of transitioning uh, different grades in on different days to allow for um, you know the building transitions and the uh, building staff to work in smaller groups. Uh, one highly successful uh, start uh, this year was when our 12th graders greeted our kindergartners on the first day of school. Uh, so we certainly look to repeat that. Uh, similarly. Uh, we have, are introducing, well not introducing, um, the, the calendar we're proposing actually reduces the number of half days by two. This year we had 16, next year's calendar is proposing 14, uh, but still allows for um, the appropriate amount of staff development time and days uh, built in. Uh, one change that is instead of having a half day the day before Thanksgiving, we are proposing that um, that would be a full day off, uh, and the start of winter break would begin with a half day. But other than that, uh, pretty similar to our present calendar. Any comments or questions regarding the calendar? No. <coughs> okay, we have an updated policy, the Federal Fiscal Compliance Policy. Yes. Well, I can, I, I'll speak to it. Um, so this okay. really is uh, an update to policy that's already in place to just align with um, update guidance uh, that basically oversees any federal money that we receive and, and how we um, use it, how we um, account for it, our financial reporting, our accounting records, the internal controls, um, in addition to the uniform grant guidance uh, that also helps to govern uh, the federal grants that we receive. Any questions on the policy changes? No. Okay. Uh, field trip, African American studies, and I guess is that Black Student Union? Yes. Field trip to the National Great Blacks Museum. So I have the privilege of introducing you to one of the high school Spanish department teachers, Ms. Tamika Burton. And before I let her discuss the field trip that our classes and our BSU is taking, I would like to take the opportunity, it's not every day that she dresses like this, uh, but during the month of February, uh, she takes an opportunity to dress as um, a famous black American. And we have the privilege, I'm gonna give you some clues. She does have candy. Um, we are living in history right now. For those of you that don't know, there is the first female black coach that will be coaching in the Super Bowl, one of our own Philadelphia Eagles. Does anyone know her name? Oh, I know her title. Kylie, help him out. Yes, Miss, Miss Autumn Lockwood, um, who actually responded to Tamika's post this morning. Um, really? We post a picture of her every morning, um, and Autumn Lockwood herself actually responded and said um, that she thought it was pretty cool. And we also have NBC 10? Yes. NBC 10 coming on the 21st um, to do a spotlight on Tamika and what she does for our kids. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to her. Good evening. Actually, sorry, I have a loud voice and that's what's gonna mess me up. <laughs> so this year, as part of our efforts to bring learning outside the classroom and now that COVID restrictions have eased, the first advice department, Ms. Lebowski will be here as well, but he did the brief that he did along with the Black Student Union, believe it will be an incredible opportunity to be able to bring our African American history classes, as well as the members of the BSU, to the National Great Blacks and Wax Museum in Baltimore for an interactive guided tour on March 21st. 
This museum really helps us move from VF teaching in our classes, as well as in VF years, in a lively and meaningful way, and will be a really fun event for our students. Our goal is to bring 90 people between staff and students with a 10 to 1 ratio of 10 to 1 for students and 1 staff member. This would encompass all of our enrolled optional researchers, as well as members of the Black Student Union, including our faculty. In order to transport the students, we would need to request the buses and would work with the five fifteen cafeteria team to make sure that those packed lunches would be provided for each student on the trip. We plan on a 10.30 arrival to the museum, so probably leaving at between 8 and 8.30, given traffic, to allow for plenty of time to organize and find our way to our tour guides with an 11 a.m. start time for the tour. The cost of the guided tour per person is $13.50, with a total of $1,215 for 90 individuals. We have the invoice as well. I forgot to grab it from the printer. But we believe this field can work with us an amazing opportunity for our students by showing them how to learn outside the classroom and is well worth the extra logistical planning for a trip out of school. Any questions? I think it's a great idea. Can we just clarify, is it in Baltimore or Washington? It's in Baltimore. Baltimore, yeah. sorry. Okay. I, I was wondering how you were. Yeah, I was wondering how you were getting there in two and a half hours. Jeffy's going to drive. And is it? <laughs> That's more like flying low. Yeah. Is it actually the 23rd or the 13th? It is the 23rd. So originally, the, okay. I did tell Ms. Gallagher that it was the 13th, but the date is actually the 23rd. Okay. I just want to make sure we get it on next week's voting Correct. agenda properly. Yeah. Any additional questions? Great. Can board members go? I'm sorry. Can board members go? <laughs> if you want to act as a chaperone, yeah, by all means. <laughs> no, it's a great idea. Thank you. So next up we have um, a matter, it's actually two resolutions for two students. They're confidential student matters that we cannot go into detail on, but we are required to vote on them in a public meeting that will occur next week. No, that's going to occur right after this meeting. Oh, that's going to, oh, that's the one for right after this meeting. Sorry. That's going to occur in 10 minutes. And um, so number 10 is a resolution to approve a contract with special legal counsel. And I believe this is our land use attorney for the state. Mm -hmm. Or is this? It's actually um, a special cybersecurity attorney. Okay. So um, Kevin, I know, is working on that resolution. That'll happen next week. Okay. So if we could just post that as soon as possible with a copy of the agreement for the board to review, that would be great. Mm -hmm. um, we now have a presentation. Yes. Duff, we're ready if you want to turn it on. And just while we're waiting for the screen uh, to come on, uh, I'll preface by saying this um, idea and proposal has been ruminating for probably the last two years. Um, so we understand um, that it's new to, to many people and it takes a little time to absorb it. And so I, I just encourage you to take some time to sit with the information if you haven't done so already. Um, I also know there was questioning of if we were thinking about it two years ago, why we didn't speak about it, but there's a lot of things that go into making decisions and um, moving forward with proposals. And the, the presentation itself is gonna kind of start broad and then get narrow with relevant data. Um, and even the data I share is um, I, I know transitions isn't the sole factor behind it, um, but it is the one component that as a school organization we can control. I can't control the impact of a pandemic um, or the learning loss that has happened because of that, nor can we control 
you know, the socioeconomic background of, of our families. Um, we can certainly do everything in our power to create strongly aligned programs um, in our K to 12 continuum that promotes as much success uh, for our students and their families and our staff as possible. Okay, so with all that being said, uh, we'll start. So we even think about like what is a charter school? We know charter schools were created um, to provide additional opportunities and options for families. Um, but no matter what, the, the, the goal and the intent is the same and as any school, and that's to improve student learning and to increase and improve learning opportunities for all students. We know that in uh, recent years, charter schools have been called incubators of innovation. And you started to wonder, well, where, that was never in the definition of a charter school. And, and here it turns out we can attribute that statement to President Obama's proclamation during National Charter Schools Week in 2012. And we think of, when we think about what innovation means, I know a lot of people automatically go to it's out of the box thinking. It is to a degree, uh, but we also know as an organization, we have boxes that we have to stay within. We have physical limitations to our buildings. We have limitations to our uh, income and our expenses. So that when you think about what innovation is, it's how do you within the, the box and within your limitations, can you create something new and better? Okay. Um, so when we look at the history of Collegium, we know that over its almost 25 year history, it has always been adaptive and innovative as far as being able to be responsive to the need, to the growth, um, to recognize you know, what materials and, and physical um, things we have at, at our uh, disposal, and we adapt. Okay, so these next three slides basically lay out a timeline of how things have adapted over, uh, over time since our inception and our beginning in 1999. Okay, so how we started in Westchester, quickly outgrew that. We moved into where we currently are in the Oakland's Corporate Center. Okay, and over time, how we acquired more space, uh, used space very creatively. Okay, up until the present, okay, we know our, our last big venture was in 2021 when we opened where we sit now, this beautiful facility that took us two years um, from groundbreaking to uh, dedication. And our next big project uh, is finally being able to come to fruition. In 2020, we, we purchased property over Clover Mill that due to the uh, bond deal that we successfully completed in the fall, which enabled us to purchase the 468 and 486 buildings. It will also provide the revenue to now develop our Clover Mill field, which we're very excited about. Okay. But what's next on the horizon? And the proposal is to create two five to eight buildings using the current 500 and 535 buildings full implementation in the 2024-2025 school year, which would coincide with our 25th anniversary as a school. Okay. So why? Okay. When we look at a, our current setup, a student attending Collegium beginning in kindergarten through 12th grade will attend school in four buildings, go through three transitions in their time here. Okay. Research has shown that transitions can be detrimental to, to students, okay? Um, it can have, be shown to have numerous negative effects, um, particularly on students uh, that come from socioeconomically disadvantaged uh, backgrounds. Okay. From a developmental uh, perspective, we know that during those adolescent years, children are already going through a lot of internal transitions. So to introduce additional external transitions exacerbates uh, what they're already experiencing developmentally as they mature. 
on the flip side, we know that consistency helps students. Okay. Having longer time uh, with a, a group of, of teachers and adults and trusted adults uh, allows students uh, to develop long-term relationships, gives them an opportunity for more adult mentors in their lives. It also allows for a greater opportunity for a stronger home and school connection, okay, for the staff to develop stronger family ties and connections, okay. Um, more grades in one building from a curricular and academic standpoint allows for greater vertical alignment in programming. Okay. We also think about in education, there's, there's the saying, begin with the end in mind, the backward design. Okay. Uh, we know that Stephen Covey in his Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, um, that's one of his, uh, their traits. Okay. To be able to begin with the end of mind means you have a clear understanding of where you want to go and where we want our students to be when they leave us. Okay. Um, we know that we have that. It's captured in our, in our current vision and mission statement. Okay. We know where we want our students to get to. This summer, uh, our K-12 academic team spent a lot of time with the survey results that we had sent out last year, gleaning from families and staff, in addition to you know, academics, what additional competencies or skills do we want our students to possess when they leave us? We, we captured these five qualities in what we're, we're calling our portrait of a graduate, okay? Um, we want them to be courageous. We want them to develop strong citizenship skills. Uh, we want them to be highly collaborative. We want them to be creative, and we want them to be critical thinkers. And there's also the piece that we can't uh, make light of or, or not see, and that's our federal and state accountability. Okay, students are required uh, to take the Keystone exams uh, to meet uh, our federal accountability, um, but we also know that as of Act 158, there are different graduation pathways for our students to get on. They still need to take the Keystone exam, and if possible, if they could be successful in that first taking, then it leaves the door open to them for many more opportunities. Okay. So we want them to be as prepared for that as possible uh, when they get to ninth grade and beyond. Some of the data that we've been looking at, um, we'll, I'll start first with our enrollment data. So when I look at our enrollment trends uh, over the last 10 years, uh, we see, and so we talk a lot at, at our administration meetings that, you know, as a school of choice, we know that anytime a student changes buildings, that a parent might think, well, if I'm changing the building, why don't I change a school? Okay, maybe we want to go somewhere else. Okay, so we really look at those transitional times. Uh, so certainly look at the average retention rate between fourth and fifth grade, because we know how we are set up right now. Students have to change buildings after fourth grade. And we are retaining approximately 98% of our students between fourth and fifth grade. Okay, the next time they're leaving is, again, after sixth grade going into seventh, and we're retaining about 96%, um, same rate around between seventh and eighth, and between eighth and ninth, high 90s. The next time, we, the one time, other than between K and one, which is a large transition uh, time for us, uh, is between fifth and sixth grade. It's about a 92% retention rate. And when we ask families that are leaving us why they're leaving, um, most often they're saying they want their child to have a truer middle school experience. And most other middle schools are set up as six, seven, eight, okay? Um, and just so you know, historically, when I came to the, when I joined uh, Collegium just about seven years ago, at that point, we were in the process of, develop, of, of developing 468, 86, and 150 and splitting them. And the original thought was to try to be a K-5 elementary. Um, this is where the box comes in. They just don't fit in those buildings. We just don't have the physical space in those two buildings to house all those students. 
can say. Um, Sean Murphy, who was here long before I, actually shared the piece that the original plan was always to have a five to eight piece, you know, uh, grade span building. Um, I couldn't find that written down anywhere. The next piece uh, of data we looked at was our percentage of economically disadvantaged students in our school. Um, so this data goes back in to, from 2010 to present. Uh, so in 2010, our percentage of students who qualified as economically disadvantaged was 23%. Um, we are just under 50% at this point. Okay, so that rate has, um, that percentage has more than doubled. Think about the impact of transitions on students who come from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds. But then I started looking at our assessment data, okay, as measured by, you know, the state assessment. So this slide is for the PSSA ELA, the number of, or the percentage of proficient advanced students. Same grade, different students. So the blue line is fifth grade, red sixth, yellow seventh, and green eighth, okay. Um, so when you look at 15, 16, you say, okay, uh, that to me is what should happen as a student matures uh, through the grades. You see an increase in the, the percentage of students uh, qualifying as proficient and advanced. Um, and then we, we start to see those levels start to drop off. Um, we know that 2021 20, and 21-22 are the impact of COVID probably, which we will be figuring out and, and, and addressing, hence where I talk about the learning loss. Um, but we, we kind of see across five to eight just kind of a, a leveling off, not a growth, okay? Same thing for math, okay? Um, so this is same grade, different students. Over time, not, not, a, not an increase or a growth as we would want to see as students develop uh, academically and you know, just mature. So then we looked at cohort achievement and what cohort achievement is following the same group of students through the years. So this is our current 10th grade students, um, class of 2025. Um, you can see uh, the blue line is their ELA, uh, their performance in the ELA PSSA, the red line in their math. Um, and through that five to eight grade span, uh, we just see a decrease in performance. This is our current ninth grade. Okay, um, again, same trend, you know, and I'm going to remind you, again, beginning with the end of mind, sending our students into high school who now have the federal and state accountability uh, to meet a graduation requirement. We want them going into ninth grade as strong as possible. And as a K-12 school, we look at the importance that each one of us plays in that journey to, uh, to our uh, ninth to 12th grade. So then I started to look at, all right, there's academic performance, but what's happening behaviorally? Okay, SWIS is our, the system we use with our PBIS system in each building, which basically tracks uh, referrals, okay, based on unexpected behaviors, um, student code of conduct. Okay. So I know that graph is a little messy and a little busy, uh, the blue line along the bottom, again, it's, it's the average, right? So that's fourth grade, right? Those lower numbers. And then you see as they just move up into the higher grades, the increase in referrals. So they're all different students. That's the average across those years, similar to the same grade, different students. But now here's the, the current ninth grade, what their cohort Swiss referrals look like. Okay, so you can see in fourth grade, seventh grade year was the year, I guess it was 2021, uh, when we were in and out in all different versions because of COVID. Um, 
My guess is if I were to extrapolate that data, the line would go straight up, okay? But because students were in and out, half, half in, half out, uh, part-time, uh, there were fewer referrals. So then, certainly important to consider, well, if we're looking at creating mirror buildings, we need to look at the physical layout of the buildings and the capacity of the building and what they currently house. Uh, and that's what this slide captures. So basically, the total number of rooms in each building, the current staff in each building, the current additional programs that run in each building, and you can see those pretty, uh, pretty similar between the two buildings. Uh, the box on the lower left corner basically looks at by the time we are looking to do this in 24-25, what the enrollment in each grade would be projected to be and what the total building uh, numbers would, would look like. So when we talk about some of the logistical knowns, these are more big picture items um, because we know that many of the details that need to be worked out are very specific. Um, the bell schedule for both buildings would be the 7.30 to 3. We would, both buildings would be in the maroon uniform. The original idea that each K-4 building would act as a feeder uh, school to one 5-8 building. Uh, part of the rationale behind that is based on uh, special ed programming as well as some of the feedback from the current 500 staff. Uh, you know, some of the challenges uh, and concerns that they express is that the two buildings, students not knowing each other, coming together for the first time in fifth grade um, creates some of the behavioral challenges that they see. We also see that when they come into fifth grade together for the first time, our two most intensive special ed programs, which are run separately in our two K-4 buildings, now come together as well, okay? Having two 5-8 buildings would allow those programs, again, to be kept separate, uh, which would help tremendously, uh, especially from a staffing perspective. We know that staffing challenges have been, uh, you know, pervasive most especially in special ed, trying to fill special ed positions. Right now we are duplicating uh, those two intensive programs in both the 500 and 535 buildings. The ability to uh, allocate each program to a separate building would in, uh, increase the staffing capacity uh, of, of covering those programs. It would also help us target very specifically the supports and programming that we could give to the staff in those buildings, okay? Um, we know that we need to add additional space to the 500 building to uh, allow uh, and accommodate the PE space. Right now, their gym is their cafeteria, is their auditorium, okay? We also know that the bathroom fixtures in the 500 building uh, need to be updated. Um, and currently, the thought is that the current administrative and support staff that is currently in each building will remain. We're going to be assessing, you know, what additions or changes uh, to those teams would need to be made. So what are some next steps? Uh, on February 1st, I presented this to both the 500 and 535 staffs. Uh, we, following those presentations, we distributed a, a survey to those teams. Uh, and, and that evening we also communicated to parents who would be impacted to uh, advertising this board meeting and inviting them here. February 9th, here we are. Uh, next week, we will look to distribute a very similar survey to parents to glean feedback uh, based on uh, this presentation. Uh, the week of February 20th, we're looking to start to meet with smaller uh, grade level and department teams in each of the uh, buildings the 500 and 535 building. Uh, the week of March 6th, we'll look to host uh, parent town halls for feedback and question and answers. Uh, during the month of April, we'll continue to collect uh, staff and parent feedback. We'll have update meetings. 
we will have our respective building administrators will be meeting with staff members individually if need be in may will certainly focus on preparing our fourth grade students for transition during the spring and summer teams from both buildings will be collaborating on schedules and t s s p b i s u d l mastery learning equity and we also look to create staff transition teams in both buildings to help address the the specifics that we need to to look at a program was shared with us that we really want to explore it's from the boomerang project and it's a for a specific transition program called where everybody belongs it focuses on service learning and character development during those middle school years provides teacher training student to student mentoring school safety and anti bullying training programs and then we will look to come to the march ninth public work session with any follow up information or certainly any information that we glean from the surveys and feedback so for consideration at the march sixteenth public board meeting we would be recommending that for the twenty three twenty four school year that we would move the five hundred building to the seven thirty to three bell schedule that we would allow for both green and maroon uniforms in five hundred that we would install the additional PE space, update the student bathrooms, make sure that outside the two buildings that there are mere outside spaces for uh, student uh, recess, uh, and we look to add whatever administrative and support staff to each building. And then finally, for the 24-25 school year, the creation of the 258 buildings um, using our current 500 and 535 buildings. So I just want to thank you. Uh, for your time and attention, um, and most importantly, the words. So, questions, comments? So, the next year, the 500 would still have fifth and sixth grade? Correct. Excuse me, uh, we're, we're going to be doing comments in a moment. Um, she meant for the board, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, she did. Yeah. <laughs> so any, any members of the board have any questions or comments on that? So I think it begs the question, why not go further and do, you know, a handful of K through six buildings and a couple seven to 12. If you think that the transitions are that detrimental. Uh, physical space limitations. <clears throat> and you don't think there's any way to think through that, work through it? Well, it's more than that. You have significant investment in infrastructure. You've got different size toilets, different size sinks, different size desks, um, different security protocol because of the difference in the ages between the students. No, I get that. But if transitions are this detrimental, yeah. like why not w explore going further? We can certainly look at that, but I know when we have looked at other configurations, we are limited by the number of classrooms and buildings and the ability to house Mm -hmm. But we'll certainly look at that. There's also a different programming. There's even between fifth and sixth grade, there is a shift in curricular and instructional programming, which so K to six wouldn't align appropriately. Mm -hmm. um. Young Robert? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, so it's nice to pull it together. A lot of work here. I appreciate that. Um, I know when I was looking at this, when my son took collegium, one of the things, well, two things were all day kindergarten and long as school days for a younger child, right? So if now fifth and sixth graders are done at three, I'm wondering what type of feedback they get from the parents and guardians because now there's students that get home earlier in the day, and they're younger. There's also going to be expanded opportunities for extracurricular activities for them. Okay. Any 
other comments or questions? Um, I feel like the data is in isolation. Like it's a little hard for me to make some of those leech leeches that you know that correlate to a transition. Like I'm wondering in particular, especially with standardized scores and whatnot. Like what does the benchmark look like for other districts that transition and whatnot? We can look at that. So you're doing uh, town halls March 6th and I guess 7th and 8th. Because we're here the 9th. Because we're here the 9th, but will you have the data from those town halls in the summer that's available for the 9th? Um, from the feedback, well, we'll, we'll, we'll have yeah. survey feedback. We're sending a survey first okay. to okay. parents. So we'll have survey feedback on the 9th, and then we can tune into the town halls. Sure. Are you surveying the staff as well? Yes, they received it after um, they already received our survey. Oh, great. And we'll have that data? Yes. Is that you? Great. I could probably bring preliminary and we'll see, we'll see that. Are you looking at doing other, other school districts that have the same issues? Are you looking at some sort of realignment to address the issues or are you unique? I, I, I'll be honest, I, I mean, I, I get the sense that most districts pretty much have established their grade spans in their buildings. Um, Quite honestly, most of them do K-5 elementary, six, seven, eight middle, and then nine, 12 high school, you know, Coatesville and Downingtown have pulled out, or well, Downingtown has the sixth grade center. So I think, you know, they, they do it differently based on meeting their student needs. And um, while we can certainly take a look at what other districts and how they are aligned, um, you know, I, I guess I would encourage us to to do what we think is, is right for our students. We know we serve a unique population just drawing from so many different districts and, and, and those, those factors play out very differently for us. Districts are dealing with uh, one population you know, from within their, their community. They have, um, they do an intermediate high school, 9-10, a senior high school, 11-12. Uh, I think they do K-5 elementary and they do 6, 7, 8 middle. Single one of each throughout or? A single one. Sing, single high school, single and middle school? So they have, one, they have one senior high school, one intermediate high school. Um, they have two middle schools, I believe, and I'm not sure how many elementary schools. I found, I, so one uh, TE does a five to eight uh, middle school. Um, I didn't find any other school in the area that, that has that grade span. Um, you know, I think there's also a piece that is, is important to remember. We, we're a K-12 school. We're not a district, we're one school um, that needs to design our buildings the best way to meet the, the developmental and the academic continuum of our students. Um, I think each building takes great pride in their culture and climate and the identity they create, um, but I, I think it's important to note that we don't have a middle school. <laughs> we have a building that houses our middle school grades, um, and, and, and I think that's important to keep in mind as we look at our how we uh, design our, our, our programs. What, what do you mean by that? We have a building that houses our middle school grades but we don't have a middle school. Well, to say you have a middle school means you have a separate school from the rest of your school. We're a K-12 school, we are one school mm -hmm. um, that has multiple buildings that services the students in our grades from kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, we can talk about middle school programming um, because of the grades. It's so so I, I think we just have to be very cognizant when we're talking about schools and buildings. We are one school. What kind of feedback have you gotten from the students? 
Are they looking forward to the uh, from students? Yes. Haven't haven't gone that far, but we'll certainly layer them into the, the feedback. If I may, to another school district, you know, like Zionstown, I just look forward to everybody coming together when it gets to the summer. And especially the school districts, you know, coming back coming together at the night around with the round numbers to to see where we're at. Um, it's mm -hmm. just a great time, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering why would you pick up here? You know. Yeah, we can certainly. We can certainly ask them, get their feedback as well. It's important. Tricky feedback there. Asking third graders, how do you feel about your transition? Yeah, I've got, <laughs> you know, yeah, so. I've got third grade right now, and he's looking forward to being with friends like this. It's just, it's just great. Everybody coming together from all the different uh, schools. Wow. Well, Mallory has my third grader, and I think he'd be completely aloof to this conversation. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> He'd be looking for a bribe just to answer. Yeah, to I, re candy I really or think so. <laughs> yeah, I'm just thinking kids are going to change as they grow, right? So mm -hmm. even if we separate the schools, we're still going to see the problems. You know, as they as they grow, they're going to change. Their behavior is going to change. We're just going to see the problems in different buildings. You know, that's that's the way I see it. You know, I'm not sure that the splitting it into two different buildings is going to solve the problem. That's my opinion. I think and there is a, a a function of it where there's going to be familiarity. As the kids go from fifth to eighth grade, they will have seen the teachers in the hallways. They will get to know the teachers that are going to be teaching them over the next few years. And I think that adds to a comfort level and a safety and a security feeling that, that maybe isn't tangible and measurable, but will enhance perform, student performance, academic performance. It's, it's, this is also bigger than just splitting kids between two buildings. It, mm -hmm. This is about comprehensive kind of overhaul and development of a an aligned program that can address the the challenges that we are currently seeing across those two buildings which while they think they are different um, the challenges that we see uh, are very similar as far as behavior challenges staffing challenges academic challenges to create a comprehensive uh, program over the course of those four years uh, can can more comprehensively address that. Mm -hmm. And for the kids who, you know, we look at it that it's it's also builds in a release valve um, for students who you know just may have personality clashes. Uh, to give them an option of, of a different a different building and a, and a fresh start is is also a good thing any other comments or questions from the board okay any of the board members have any new business no okay uh, we do not have any more emailed comments correct Okay, ma'am, um, we can do comments now, if you'd like to come down. Please state your name and your municipality of residence, for the record. Sorry about that. Um, my name is Forrest Lee Costin, and I live in Valley Township. Can you spell your last name? I'm sorry. Uh, C-O-S-T-I-N. Okay. Thank you. Um, and you have a, a three-minute comment period. Yep. Um, I think it's great about the changing of the buildings, but that has nothing to do with the behavior. Um, my, my son is in the 500 building. Um, the administration should be here tonight um, discussing this with us as, as well. Um, you know, somewhere down the line, we have to uh, fix behavior. If the student doesn't want to behave, send them home. You know, my son comes home teaching me every day about ACEs. My son can't answer a math problem. You know, these, that, that should be talked about tonight. You know, not a building. You know, um, Basically, from what you said, my son's going to fail the next few years. Like, what, you know, it's not good. And uh, I don't do good speaking in front of crowds. So. You, you don't? But, um, yeah, like, I have no hopes for him. And this should be a privilege for kids to come to the school. And if they don't want to be here, send them home. You know, a uh, building's not going to help. And some of the staff needs to come. <laughs> Sorry. 
Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Marissa Donlevy. I'm an employee at the current 7E building. Um, and I will try to keep it to three minutes, but my comments um, are on behalf of many. I mentioned to my colleagues that I was going to be at this board meeting, many of whom could not attend and asked that I would speak on their behalf, but wish to remain, remain anonymous. Um, the biggest concern from our perspective, or at least from those who, who discussed this with me, was how does our four stage data compared to Downingtown, who also has four buildings, Coatesville, who also has four buildings, Adam Grove, who also has four buildings, Great Valley, who also has four buildings, and Spring Ford, who has a fifth and sixth, seventh, and eighth building as well. Um, that was a question that was asked when this was presented to us as staff members. That was a question that was asked by the board. Um, and it is a question that is still yet to be answered. Um, also, how will this impact our students who are still going through the transition of a post-COVID education, students and staff who are just starting to gather their footing after such an abrupt and unexpected transition of COVID. Um, making another big unexpected change for this class of students will have its impacts, um, as well as we keep talking about behavior issues and, and as a concerned mother also mentioned, these behavior issues Will, will we guarantee that these behavior issues will disappear from being in two separate buildings or will we now just have two separate buildings with these same behavior issues? Um, in changing the idea that the first building that all of our grade level students will be in together at the high school, how is that going to create a collegium identity if we have a whole separate situation until we get up to the high school? Um, another big concern is that we, am, am I right in assuming that the, the fifth through eighth building will be busing with the high school too? So we will be having 10 year olds on the same school bus as 18 year olds. Um, that is a major concern for, for staff who have had children in this community. Um, and yes, so that is another major concern. Also with, with our, our budget presentation today, we're currently behind on, on the budget in a lot of areas, so where will we be finding this money for these major renovations that need to happen in order for this plan to be successful? Um, and how does our PSSA score data, which is not looking good in, in the graph, compare with when we made curriculum changes? Is that related to these transitions or is it aligned with when we made changes to our overall curriculum? Um, the, the Swiss spike when it came to referrals and student write-ups, that did occur um, post pandemic if we look at the data and we can we can assume that that would have been a linear trajectory upward but we will never know that um, and a lot of these behaviors that we are seeing are m most likely related as we see across the entire US uh, to students who have had an un who have had an interrupted area of their education an interrupted space of their expectations and gaps in their emotional development um, at the middle school, we are seeing a lot of behavior issues that we would expect more at the elementary level, which makes perfect sense because a lot of our students have to relearn how to student again. Um, and so how will this impact that as well? And are we going to be pushing those behavioral changes that we see in, in the, the fifth and sixth building off to the ninth grade when we actually have them all together again? Will we still have that same level of, of problem that we were mentioning in the presentation um, at the fifth and sixth buildings, because it's the first time that they're all together, will that now be transitioned over to the high school, or are we delaying the inevitable in that? Um, another big concern for us as well is how that will be structured in the current buildings that we have. So we have our seven and eight building. We have eighth grade on one floor, seventh grade on another floor. I believe it's very similar at the five, six building. So how will we be housing four grades in these buildings, even if we do still have similar classroom sizes and and class sizes, what will that look like logistically? Um, so I, I, yes. you're a minute over now, and I That's apologize. That's okay. I, I can stop talking. But um, these were all concerns that were brought so, about by staff members. So, um, I would suggest email them to the email address, mm -hmm. whatever you weren't able to cover, or come back next week. I know it's Thursday night and you teach all day. But if you would email them over, we do get those comments when they come in for the board meeting comments. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you Plus, so much. I believe Thank they're all captured in the survey responses. Yep. yep. Sure. Thank you. Thank 
the Go Go West type one. Um, can you hear me? No, I'm gonna pull it out. Here. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so, I, Marita, you said that we're a K-12 school. Mm, two years ago, we talked about after COVID being a 12 K-12 school. We talked about the transitions. We talked about behaviors. We talked about how we could make one community and have one big collegium like we used to be. And parents were taught, told that we have different buildings and each school can do their own thing. And this is what this school's got to do compared to this school because of the behaviors and what the admin has in there and what you know teachers want to do. We can't play both ends of the card here. We're 12, if we're a 12K school, then we need to be a true 12K school. What's happening at the kindergarten level needs to happen all the way up to the high school. And you've had veteran teachers and parents that have said the same thing for the last two years. We have been begging for this. You guys are going into new, I, my kid's out in a year. This shouldn't impact me, but my brothers have been here, the family's been here for 20, almost 25 years. I don't wanna see a school that my te the teachers that have taught my brothers leave because of this. They don't wanna, I'm sure teachers don't wanna be split up from their, the buildings that they are now and how you're gonna decide who's going to this 5-8 building and who's going to this 5-8 building and who's gonna work with this admin and who's gonna work with that one. I mean, they've been together. We have had so much trouble trying to get enough teachers in here and to stay. We can't make a whole nother change again. Co uh, COVID just happened. Let's get through this year, actually not next year, it's gonna be hopefully the first year we're not even dealing with COVID. Not even thinking about having five days off and having to, to be home and all of that. Let's, let's let it settle first. Let's see it come up. You talked about PSSAs in there. I will 100% tell you, and there's teachers that will tell you, my son stunk at PSSAs. They, going into ninth grade, we're gonna put him in a remediation math. He wasn't even almost allowed to take Algebra one. He aced Algebra one ninth grade. Thank God I knew what I was talking about and looked at that. He went into Algebra two, aced it. Geometry honors this year, 11th grade. He's got straight A's in top of his class. If I was a parent and looked at PSSA, PSSA scores, my kid wouldn't be where he is today. He'd be in the lowest levels on everything, not looking at going to, you know, Johnstown Pitt or, or yeah, now Tuna Penn State for veterinary sciences. It wouldn't be there. We can't look at test scores just like they just said. Get rid of finals. Get rid of midterms. These kids cannot be counted on one day to say that's what they're going to look like for the rest of their lives. And that's what that whole presentation was about is where our, our test scores are. And it's something that you guys really need to consider. You can say that we're gonna send out questionnaires and do these town halls. We did it for two years. Parents were yelling, nothing changed. We didn't see one change that we asked for. Thank God for the new principal at the high school because we saw a change in the high school. But we still have problems with ninth graders. Last year was a mess. Let's figure it out first. Stop changing all the time. Any other comments? Heather Melito, Valley Township. Um, I'm coming at this from two angles because I'm a current eighth grade teacher in a public school, but I'm also a parent. I'm a current eighth grader, a fifth grader, and a second grader. So the span is there for me. And my biggest concern is my current fifth grader is now going but even my little one who has special needs is now, when she goes into fifth grade, gonna be riding the bus with seniors. I mean, we're talking about children who have behavioral problems, who are young and they're struggling and you're putting a fifth grader on a bus with a, a senior, a 10th grader. I have TJ eighth grade and the sixth graders don't wanna walk down my hallway sometimes because of the behavior. The difference between an eighth grader and a sixth grader can be 40 pounds. Um, to me, that's a concern we gotta look at, especially in the setup of the building. It's not that it can't be worked with. I think the busing and transportation and the time slots may be a bigger problem. Uh, Coatesville busing sucks. And it's gonna suck worse with this transition. Um, I don't know if there's any fix with it. 
And as far as the staffing of a building change like this, you are going to upset staff in mass. I have had, out of my three children, probably five teachers resign this year, mid-year. It, it, as a teacher myself, to have them resign, I, I don't see how you can resign in the middle of the year unless it's that bad. Because otherwise you stick it out for the contract that you've signed. Um, we gotta find a way to retain the teacher and deal with the behavior, the bullying, the issues in that 500 building with bullying need to stop because they're not being dealt with. You have a group of children who are wanting control over that building and it needs to be dealt with. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Natalie Thomas, and I'm also an employee at the middle school, the current 7-8 building. Um, obviously, a lot of the concerns have already been, you know, said. Um, one thing that I want to touch on is I don't think it's a transition problem. I really think it's a curriculum problem. I am currently a special ed teacher in the eighth grade, and my curriculum is not super great. It's the first year of us using it, and I can tell you right now, most of my things are... I'm doing my own thing and I'm winging it. Or I'm using my mentor's stuff because she teaches a different curriculum than me, even though she teaches the exact same thing as me. That's where the behaviors are coming from because my kids, some of them are being challenged and others are falling behind and they're in the same class. And it's a curriculum problem. That's where, that's where why parents are pulling their kids out. That's why parents are upset. Like it's definitely all about the curriculum and I wish I had one that I actually trusted. Thank you. Any other comments? Not seeing any. Uh, we have reached the end of our agenda. So, boring any other commentary from the board, we will go ahead and adjourn. Um, our public meeting next week. Oh, I'm sorry, we have the public meeting tonight. That's right. I keep forgetting about that, and I apologize. Okay, so um, we have a special public meeting that was advertised as required by Pennsylvania law and the bylaws of the Board of Trustees. Date, time, and location published in the Daily Local News, the Collegian website, and on the Collegian calendar. This is to consider and vote on two confidential student matters. I ask that we please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, roll call. Chris McHenry is here. Mr. Baxter? Present. Mr. Thankachan? Present. Mr. Randall is away for business. Mr. Brown is away for family matters. And Mr. Gerardo? Present. We do have a quorum. Um, we're going to bypass the public comment on agenda items as they are confidential student matters. Um, and uh, is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, any discussion or comment on the agenda? Hearing none, all those in favor of adopting the agenda say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Very well. Um, these are identical with the exception of name. Um, negotiated withdrawal agreements with the guardians of the two students. Um, therefore, we will consider them together. And is there a motion uh, to consider the execution of the confidential withdrawal agreement resolutions? So moved. Second. Thank you. Um, any comment not specific to the actual students? from any of the trustees. 
Very well, hearing none, uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Mr. Baxter? Um, there are none. Yay. Mr. Sankachan? Yay. Mr. Gerardo? Yay. And Chris McHenry votes yes as well. Um, there is actually, because this is a separate meeting, an opportunity for additional public comment on any matters regarding the school, if anybody wishes to make any additional comments. Seeing none, is there a motion for adjournment? So moved. And a second? Second. All in favor of adjournment say aye. 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 Any opposition? Very well, the public meeting is adjourned and we will be back here next week at six o'clock for our February public meeting where we will vote on the mat most of the matters discussed tonight. Um, just a heads up, we will be starting in an executive session next week. Um, so we may be a bit delayed for a little while. Thank you all, get home safely. Go Eagles. Eagles.